All right, yeah, so get signed up for that. I, I'm excited about it, uh, 8 to 12, and um, man, I, my wife should really be teaching it because she's had to endure me for 30 years, and, uh, but it's going to be a great morning. Hey, today we are kicking off a series of messages that I am especially uh, excited about. We're going to be talking about hearing the voice of God. Let me say that again, hearing the voice of God. Now, I almost want you to consider... This series, the next three weeks that we're going to do, a part two of a series that we concluded a couple of weeks ago where we talked about the miracle of the Bible. And when we talked about the Bible, we looked at how God has provided us with this most beautiful communication tool, uh, what we call the scriptures, both the Old Covenant or Old Testament and New Covenant, New Testament, is a download of his heart to ours. What we have in the scripture is an expression of truth about God himself. What did God want us to know about himself, about creation, about his intention for design, about how human beings are supposed to live? Of course, the scripture self-attests that it is alive and active and sharper than a double-edged sword. It has the power to work on our lives and correct us and to teach us and to reprove us. And of course, the Bible really is a miracle. And so I can't encourage you enough to uh, begin to get into this if you're not regularly, but when we talk about hearing the voice of God, you would assume that, well, I must mean read the Bible, and I don't. As inspired as this is, and it is, and it is God's word by which we check everything we think we're hearing from the Lord, let me just say to you from the beginning that the Lord wants to speak to you through his Holy Spirit in addition to what you read in the pages of scripture. He also wants to speak to you through the Holy Spirit by using the scripture. But I need to remind you what we said when we looked at the miracle of the Bible. We said, don't forget, our God speaks. And God has enabled human persons to hear him. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. I know that there are some of us here that have more conservative backgrounds and the immediate concerns that you're having is you're going, Pastor Shane, I thought hearing God was for the weird ones. You know, it always makes me a little leery when I hear somebody say, well, God told me. And I have to admit, people use that as a trump card too often. I also have to admit that uh, very super spiritual people sometimes feel like God is always speaking when in fact sometimes they're hearing their own emotion and all of that. So I admit that there are abuses within the church that we should be leery of, but I do want to say no, in fact, the Holy Spirit speaks to people. For example, let's take a look at what God's word says about these things. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says, now dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about, watch this, the special what? interesting. Now, he's saying, I want you to know about the special abilities that who gives us? The Spirit gives us. He says, I don't want you to misunderstand this. You know that when you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along and worshiping what kind of gods? Oh, speechless gods. Meaning, our God is different. Our God is not speechless. He is full of speech. And he wants to speak. In fact, I would just underline, because this is the important part of this introductory section as we're looking at is, he literally says there are, underline it, special abilities that the Spirit gives us. Now, this is what we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. Um, that, That God really does want to say, I do it differently. I am not a dumb or a mute idol. I am a real God that wants to speak into your life. Now, I also want us to read from Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, it's in your notes, or you'll see it on the screen, or if you have your Bible, you can look there. Because Romans 8 is very insightful for understanding how God's speaking to us works. It's going to be our main text today, so we're going to draw a lot out of it. Are you ready? All right, here we go. Let's read this. Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 7. It says, the mind governed by the flesh is what? It's hostile to God. That's an interesting thing. If your mind is governed by your flesh, you will naturally have a hostility toward the things of God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh, interesting phrasing, those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the realm of the Spirit. Watch this. You are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed, what does it say? 
if the spirit of God lives in you. So he's writing to the church. He's assuming that you're not of the flesh, but then he says, well, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you, you are who we're talking about. So again, you could have a church full of people. In the first century, they could have a house church full of people. People could be used to coming to church. They could be very religious. But in fact, they may not have the spirit of God living in them. So he says, the key here is, does the spirit of God live within you? Now he goes on. He says in verse 14, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Verse 15, the Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live again in fear. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, what are the words? Abba, Father, which in the Greek is a reference to an intimate relationship with a papa or a daddy. In fact, that's what Abba means. It means papa. Or daddy. So it's speaking to this level of intimacy that because the spirit of God lives within you that we should be able to have with God. You're my daddy. Let me run up and jump into your lap, God. Let's be close. And then it talks about how this works. Watch this. It says literally, verse 16, the spirit himself, the Holy Spirit, testifies with our spirit that we are what? There's obviously a communication going on in here because there's some confirmation that his spirit speaks to our spirit that we are children of God. There's a security, verse 17. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. And if we are heirs with God, then we are co-heirs with Christ. Now, let me just jump in right away because whenever you hear people talking about hearing the voice of God or whenever anybody comes to listen to a teaching like this, one of the obvious questions that comes up right at the start is, well, why does God want to speak to me? Why is that important? Or why is this a thing, frankly, that we should spend three weeks on and care about? So for just a minute, let's just tackle that idea. Why is it? Here's the first reason it's important. Number one, God speaking to you, write this down, is a proof that you belong to the family of God. That's what this text has said. You being able to hear the voice of God is a proof that you belong to the family of God. So for example, when I call my kids, they know dad's voice. How many know that's true? Now, why do my kids know my voice? Because I'm dad. You know, you know how this works at home. I, it won't surprise you to hear this, but whenever I'm talking to my kids at home, whenever I talk to Aiden, my 10-year-old, I don't have to say, hey, Aiden, this is Shane. This is dad, by the way, talking to you. No, he automatically knows. Of course this is dad, because he knows dad's voice. They know me. So I just start talking to them. Now watch this. The scripture clarifies this point. It says, for those who are led by the spirit of God are what? Children of God. Now, listen, if you weren't my kid, you may not know my voice. In fact, if I walked into your household, some of your kids have never met me, they'll say, mom and dad, who's that? Why? They don't know my voice, they're not my child. That's what Paul is saying here. And so the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that yes, we in fact are children of God. Now friends, I'm just gonna say to you, Paul is not saying anything new here. It makes me sad to think about how many Christians exist that they don't, how many live their life and they're walking in the flesh and they don't realize they could be listening to the Holy Spirit. Paul talks about it. Well, Jesus talked about it. What's the metaphor he used? He called us sheep and he said, listen, my sheep listen to what? My voice. I know them and they follow me. So this is proof that you actually have a relationship with Jesus, this ability to hear his voice. So that's the first thing I'd say. That's why this is so critically important. Number two is because understanding that the Holy Spirit lives in you, hearing his voice is just a byproduct. So if you just write that down, not only does it prove that I'm in the family of God, but it's the byproduct of the Holy Spirit dwelling within my physical body. Notice again, chapter eight, verse 15, it says, the spirit you received. You have received the spirit. Now, what's Paul talking about? Listen, he is talking about the old covenant promise that was looking forward to the new covenant. Bible is broken up into two covenants, the old covenant testament, the new covenant testament. The old covenant was looking forward to the new covenant. And it says, and in that day, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Listen to me. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy or speak the words of God. That's what Joel 2 says. Both. 
The prophet Ezekiel talks about this when he says, in those days I will pour out my spirit. I will sprinkle you and you will be clean. I will put my spirit within you and I will cause you to want to follow my decrees. What's he talking about? Jesus referred to it in John 3. He's talking about the born again experience. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you've been born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. He's saying you have to have this spirit thing that has happened in your life. He is in there. He is in you. More specifically, when you go to the letter to the Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, which is instructions for the church, look what it says. It says, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, that is the promised who? Holy Spirit. Spirit. By the way, the Holy Spirit is not a what. The Holy Spirit is a who. What we call the third person of the Trinity, who in fact is God. His spirit dwelling within you, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. Now, stop. What's that speaking to? I don't know if you've ever thought about this before. I reference it sometimes. But do you realize the Christian will experience two resurrections? Two resurrections, not one. The first resurrection is the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, where God, re- where God resurrects the real you, the born-again person that is supposed to live for him. The first resurrection is internal. The second resurrection is the resurrection of the body, which is what he's speaking to, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. Jesus will come back again, and our physical bodies will be resurrected. But I'm telling you something, if he lives in you, if the Holy Spirit lives in your physical body, if he is that personal, you can bet he wants to talk. He's in there. Can you imagine living with somebody but never wanting to communicate? Some of you raised your hand. You said, man, I've been married for 10 years. I've been married for 15 years. Well, I'm gonna tell you something. If you're married to a person that never, ever communicates with you, you don't have much of a relationship. Is that right? For you to have a relationship, you have to be in communication. I gotta tell you, there is a guy that comes to my house every week. I know what he looks like. I see him once a week. I know the uniform he wears. He is my pool guy. And he comes into the backyard and he walks in. He even has a key to the gate of my house. I mean, this guy has access. He can walk right in. I say hi to him. I see him through the window. I thank God that he's there, that I don't have to go out and do that particular job. But I gotta tell you, some of you, this is exactly how you are with God. You see God once a week. You wave at God, you know the uniform God wears, you may even say hi to God, but you do not know God. And for a lot of people, that's where their Christianity stops and there's no real relationship. There's a nodding, there's a hello. No, if the Holy Spirit lives in your physical body, friends, that's a relationship that God wants to nurture Friends, I'm going to tell you right now, God communicates to all of his true children. I don't care if you're a young believer or you're an old believer or you're a baby believer or you've been in the church for 50 years. I also don't take for granted that because you've been in the church for 50 years, you're even a true believer. It's very possible for a person to have grown up in the church and been religious and pay their tithes and do a million Bible studies but never really have entrusted their life over to Jesus and surrendered. It's very possible. In fact, that's the worst kind of deception because a person like that would think I'm okay. And a person like that will usually listen to a sermon like this and they'll say, man, pastor, I'm so glad you're preaching this for them. <laughs> why? Why, does, why is it important to understand that God speaks to you? Number one, because you're his child. And the father speaks to his children, number two, because he lives in your body. So the next question that comes up, and again, we're laying the foundation here, you understand. We're going to spend three weeks on this. But the next question that comes up is, what does God want to say when he speaks to us? So I want to read this to you, because if you'll notice what the text says, it's going to help. You ready? All right, let's look at verse five. We're going to read it again. He says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what? Now that is an interesting statement. What consumes you? What, what, does, what are the desires that consume your thinking, your living, your life? 
Those who are living according to the flesh always have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. So I'd ask you to evaluate yourself. What is always consuming your thoughts exactly? Because this is, God's given us a test here, you understand. And the point needs to be made that the Spirit of God is desiring to do certain things in your life and he's desiring to speak certain things into your life because of what he wants to do. Notice what the Spirit desires. God, I want to talk about what you want to talk about. Do you want to know why so many people say, well, I can't hear God, God's never spoken to me? Do you know why people say things like that? Because the average person that thinks that way, they go to God with their prayer time and they've got a list for God. Man, they've got 10 things they wanna talk to God about. Again, let's read it. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the flesh, so they go to God in their quiet time and they wanna talk to God about the temporary stuff. You go to God, God, here are my talking points for the day. God, I wanna talk to you about my job. I'd like for you to destroy my boss. God, I wanna talk to you about my health. That's not going so good. God, I wanna lose weight. God, I have cancer. Again, respect for those that are going through such horrific ordeals, but you understand, we're thinking about all these types of things. God, I wanna talk to you about the house I live in. I'd like a bigger one, please. God, I want you to bless me. God, I wanna live my best life. God, give me that promotion. God, help me through this relationship, and on and on and on. But you understand, everything that you've talked to God about is the flesh. And you wonder why God doesn't speak to you. Now, I want you to imagine for a minute, we went out for coffee and we sat there together and it's like, okay, let's have a relationship. Let's sit down and have coffee together. We sat down to God and you said, Shane, I'm so glad we're having this coffee. This coffee. I brought a list of five things I wanna talk to you about. You laid those things down on the table and you said, number one, Shane, your sermons are too long, if you could shorten that. Number two, Shane, do you realize there's such a thing as ca- called Rogaine? You can try that. Number three... Shane, I don't like the way that you're so confrontational. I feel like you're always picking on me, number four. Okay, and you're gonna go through this list of all these five things, and then you go, if you could do that for me, that'd be great, thanks so much. You walk out, I haven't had a chance to download any of my thoughts to you. I'm gonna tell you what, you have never heard my voice. Because you're only talking to me about the things that are on your mind, and the problem with you is, no offense, you're always walking in the flesh. You're not walking in the spirit. So I would like to suggest, if you want to learn to hear the voice of God, let's start getting in tune with the things that God wants to talk about. See, the Holy Spirit is a personality, therefore he has interests. There are things that he wants to say to you. There are subjects that he needs to have you open up about and he wants to discuss. So instead of going to God with a list full of things, one, two, three, four, five, how about we go to God with a blank sheet of paper and we say, God, what's the topic today? God, what kind of business do you wanna do in my life? So where does that lead me? It leads me to me just studying the scripture and what can I learn from the scripture that God always wants to talk about and so I can guarantee these are things he is always wanting to talk to you about. You ready for them? I'm about to give you a tip. These are things that God wants to speak to you about. They represent his interest, his business. So write these down. Here's the first thing. The Holy Spirit wants to talk to you about your new birth. Write that down. Now this is what theologians call, again, the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. It's his regenerating work. Let me say that again. It's such a good word. We need to get used to it. His regenerating work. What does that mean? It means that the Holy Spirit is the one that makes you into a new person. Listen, you may be here and you're religious, but it doesn't mean you're changed. Change means born again. Change means that God is revealing truth to you in a new way. He is making revelation to you of who Jesus is. He is showing you what Jesus has done. He is the one giving you faith. Do you realize that you can only have faith because the Holy Spirit has given you the ability to have faith? I'll never forget the moment where Jesus was in Caesarea Philippi. Jesus walks up to to his closest disciples. He had many, but there were an inner 12. You know about those guys. And he walks up to them and he says, hey, who do the people? say that I am and they well some say that you're Elijah and well some say that you're a prophet and some say that you're John the Baptist you know uh, come back he goes well who do you say that I am you might remember this 
Simon Peter speaks up and he says, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah. What does that mean, Christ? Christ isn't his last name, it's his role. What does it mean you're the Christ? It means that you're the savior of the world. You're the anointed one of God. What did Jesus say back to Simon? He said, blessed are you, Simon, because flesh and blood could not have revealed this to you. Only the Father could speak this to you. So God wants to talk to you about who Jesus is and what having faith is. You don't believe me? Well, look at Romans. Romans chapter 10, it says, so faith comes from what? Hearing, there you go. So the very fact that you have faith in Jesus means, see, do you understand? I hear people, you wouldn't believe the number of people that come to me and say, well, Pastor Shane, I've never heard God. Oh, yes, you have. You just don't, you haven't thought about who's speaking to you before. You know how I know you hear God? Because I get so many texts and so many emails and I get so many people coming up to me on the patio. Believe me, this is a regular thing. Somebody walks up to me, strangers that have never been here before come up to me and they go, it's unbelievable. How did you know that? How did you, are you reading my mail? How did you know what was going on in my life? And I've got to say, it's not because I know anything. I'm an idiot. I don't know anything. Who knows something? God God knows something. And who was speaking to you as I was teaching? God. Honestly, I appreciate the comments, but I'll tell you what, it really has nothing to do with me. It's that God is using the teaching of his word and he is speaking to you. Do you know how I know God speaks to you? Because I've seen some of your notes. You've brought them to me and you not only have the fill-ins, but you've written some extra things down there. Who's speaking to you when you write those extra things? God. Of course you've heard God. You wouldn't have faith. How does God speak? Well, God gives you a very specific thought and he prompts your spirit and moves you. His spirit confirms with your spirit. That's how it works. By the way, you read about people in the Bible and you go, well, man, God's never spoken to me audibly. God God barely spoke audibly to anybody. When you read these stories in the Bible that the Holy Spirit said, This isn't God speaking audibly to these people. You say, well, how do you know? I say, well, because the evidence shows us when God did speak audibly, the text says he spoke and others heard him say it. But every other time, and that's very rare, every other time, it's the Holy Spirit leading people and guiding people. So, First thing that the Holy Spirit wants to talk to you about, what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to have faith? Who is Jesus? That's the regenerating work. Number two, write this down. The Holy Spirit wants to speak to you about personal holiness. Now, that's not the Spirit's regenerating work. That's the Spirit's sanctifying work. What does it mean? It means that God cares about your morality. We just spent two weeks on sex. Why? Because God cares about your morality. God wants to speak to you about becoming like Jesus, not just sex. God cares about how you're handling your emotion. God cares about how you're lashing out in anger. God cares about your resentments. He cares about the bitterness. You understand? God cares that you are being conformed to the image of his son. He wants you to be like Jesus. Why? Because it says, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. But no, notice verses eight and nine, it says, those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. Listen, brothers and sisters, have you ever had this happen? You're living your life, but then Jesus comes in and he starts to live within you. And man, you used to cuss up a storm, but suddenly it's like you have a conviction about that. That really is God. You know what God is doing? God is saying, stop polarizing people with your filthy words. Say things that are edifying now. Suddenly you've got the Holy Spirit living within you and you feel a sense of conviction because you treat people with anger or you're a husband or a wife and you lash out in anger toward your partner and God is starting to convict you about that. That is a sign that the Spirit of God is living within you. It's personal holiness. Oh, my friends. Brothers and sisters, I am so sad for the American church today, the Western church that is so corrupt. 
men and women that live no differently than the world lives and then we wonder why nobody cares about being a Christian? Because they see no difference in how it's affected our lifestyle? I'm so sick. I, 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 I'm a, I, I have to admit, I'm a mega church pastor. We have a very large conversa- uh, congregation, and yet I am continually hearing about mega church pastor after mega church pastor after mega church pastor living in sin for decades and decades and living these double lives only to be found out later. And do you know what I think? I think, first of all, God, thank you that you've given me the grace that. That, that, you know, I, I have a fast repentance reflex, you know. It's like, man, I got to tell, you know, my wife, my family needs to know. My, my brothers needs to know. I have, a, I have 12 men that are in the church that are my personal prayer partners that I talk to all the time. And they know all the dirt, man. If you want to know the dirt, go to them. I, I, I tell you about the dirt. You guys get mad at me because you say, oh, you tell too much. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you what. I'd rather tell too much than be one of these guys living for decades in sin only to find out that they've been living a lie and playing the act. Let me tell you something. A pastor can't fall into that kind of sin unless they're never talking to God about their sanctification. How do you do that? How can you get before the throne of God every day and not have the Holy Spirit convicting you about your sin? God has to conform the character of people. What is good for you? What is not good for you? What is your sin? What should be in your life and what should be out? You get the idea. You don't tell God. God tells you. What else does he want to talk about? The Holy Spirit wants to talk to you and me about the ministry that he wants to see done in the world. Now, what is that? When we talk about the ministry that needs to get done in the world, well, this is what theologians call the Spirit's anointing with power for works of service. Acts 1.8, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then you will become something, he says. We'll read that in a minute. God is big time interested. You see it all over in the Bible. God is constantly speaking to people through the Holy Spirit about the work that he wants to get done. Friends, listen to me. This is normative. This is not exceptional. This is not for the super spiritual. Do you want to know one of the worst things that we did for for the American church is we professionalized the ministry? Oh, well, the ministry, that's for you guys. Guys... I don't do ministry because I'm a pastor. I became a pastor because I was doing ministry. I was doing ministry long before anybody gave me a title. Acts chapter 13, verse 2, it says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, notice, this is the Holy Spirit speaking, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. By the way, Acts chapter 13 is one of my favorite chapters because it's all about, Acts chapter 13 is all about what God did in the city of Antioch. And, and there were Jewish people, and there were Ethiopian people, and there were Chinese people, and there were black people, and there were white people, and there were brown people. And you know what happened? There were all these racial and ethnic divisions. And people hated each other because they thought their racial and national pride was better than anybody else. But then the gospel comes into Antioch and all of a sudden the walls start coming down and they couldn't figure out what to do because now the Chinese loved the brown and the Ethiopian loved the white and the, and, and the Jews loved the Greeks and the Romans loved the... You, you get the idea. And now everybody's coming together and they go, well, we can't be called Jewish anymore. We can't be called Ethiopian anymore. We can't be called Romans anymore. So they said, we have to come up with a new ethnos group. And he says, an In that place, they were first called Christians. I look at a congregation filled with Filipino and Asian and black and white and brown and pinkish hued, maybe. And I think this is a picture of the kingdom of God. Christians. God wants to give direction about ministry. So he says, look what he says. He says, set apart uh, Barnabas and Saul for this work. Wow. 
Can you imagine if they weren't listening to the voice of God? God loves to give direction about how to lead people and love people and care for people. Acts 15, the apostles are trying to figure out how to best guide the Gentile believers in the faith, and look at what they say. It says, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden them with anything beyond these requirements. They said, you're to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You would do well to avoid these things. Now listen, that didn't come from a Bible. The New Testament hadn't been written. Who did that come from? The Holy Spirit through the lives of people. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 puts it this way. It talks about special abilities and it says there are different kinds of gifts but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working but in all of them and in every one it's the same God at work. Now to each one is given the manifestation again of that spirit that lives within you. To each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. To one there is given through the spirit a message of wisdom. To another a message of knowledge by means of the same spirit. To another another faith by the same spirit to another gifts of healing by that one spirit to another miraculous powers to another prophecy yes prophecy is real to another the distinguishing of spirits to another speaking in different kinds of tongues yes that is real I speak in tongues to another still the interpretation of tongues all these are the work of the same spirit and he distributes to each one as he wills so what is, what's God interested in? He's interested in talking to you about what ought you to be doing for the kingdom of God. Amen. What is your level of engagement? Friends, I'm gonna tell you something. There is nothing more important in your life than the kingdom of God. Your family's not more important than the kingdom of God. Your job is not more important than the kingdom of God. I'm gonna be a grandpa soon. I'm excited about that. I'm gonna love my grandson for all he's worth, but my grandson's not more important than the kingdom of God. What's important is that I get my grandson into the kingdom of God. Amen. And so God wants to talk to me about what are the important things. What are the kingdom of God things? I talk to you about using your time, your talent, your treasure. Yes, your money, that's so personal to people. Yes, we use it all for the kingdom of God. And by the way, don't tell me, nobody should tell me they don't have money. I saw everybody's money being fired off in illegals on July 4th. I looked at my wife and I said, people say they're broke. Okay. Because we all know how much those are. Number four, the Holy Spirit wants to talk to me about my witness to the world. The Holy Spirit wants to talk to me about my witness to the world. Meaning, Acts chapter one, verse eight, I already said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. There's another moment in Acts chapter eight, verse 29, when the Holy Spirit says to Philip, hey, Philip, now notice this is just personally the Holy Spirit speaking to his spirit. I want you to go stand by that carriage. So Philip obeys. Okay, I'm gonna go stand by that carriage. And it was being ridden by an Ethiopian official. And the Ethiopian official says, hey, have you heard about this Jesus of Nazareth? And they strike up a conversation and Philip ends up leading him to Jesus. Why? Because the Holy Spirit told him to go where to stand. Now, does the Holy Spirit speak to you like that? Hey, I want you to move over and befriend that person. Hey, I want you to tell that person about Jesus. He should, because God wants to use you. So what's the bottom line? I need to move fast. The bottom line is the Holy Spirit wants to mediate the presence of Jesus and communicate his will. That's what he does. Now, what do we do? We check what we feel we're being told with the word of God. I have charismatic, I was raised Pentecostal. I would not claim that today. There there are some extremes in Pentecostal groups that I do not agree with. But I'm going to tell you, I would would claim uh, charisma. And that is that God wants to speak to his people today through the Holy Spirit. And God wants to uh, use his gifts to advance the kingdom of God. And I'm going to tell you, what do you do, though, when you feel the Holy Spirit leading you? Do you just go off willy-nilly? No, the problem, the reason people are so afraid of it is because there's so many churches that just do things, but they don't check what they're doing with the Word of God. So when a charismatic person comes to me, I said, man, I believe in the charisma. I believe in the gifts. Many of you have come to me to ask that question. I believe in all that. Gosh, I practice all that. But you have to know that we're going to check it with the Word of God. 
and we're gonna make sure it's healthy because Jesus has a job. So what is Jesus about? What does Jesus want to do? How does Jesus make himself known? What does Jesus want to say? This is what the Holy Spirit's about. And look how Jesus teaches it'll happen. Jesus in his farewell discourse is talking to his disciples and he says, look, it's good for you that I go away, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. In chapter 16, verse 13, he says, he will guide you into the truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So, how do we respond? I'm just gonna close with this very quickly. How do we respond to what God wants to do? Number one, as we lay the foundation. Here's my encouragement. Number one, start letting the Lord set the agenda. Can I just say to you, Maybe in your prayer time, it's okay to go to God with your list of things. He said, pray, Father, give me this day my daily bread. That's okay. You're asking for your daily bread. I get that. But how about this? Don't just go with your list of your daily bread. How about going with a blank sheet of paper and saying, God, what do you want to say to me? There is no telling where God is able to take a life who says, God, I give you my agenda. God, I give you my will. God, I give up my sin. See, we let other voices get so loud. In the book of Amos, God makes this very interesting prophecy. He says, you know, the days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, but it will not be a famine of food or for water, but it will be a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. And because people will no longer hear the words of the Lord, what's the result? It says people will stagger from sea to sea. They will wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Friends, in our country today, there are people looking for something that they're never gonna find because they're looking in the wrong place. How desperately they need someone like you who is listening to the Holy Spirit to go up to them and say, would you like to come to church with me? I pray that would be true of you because he cares for you because of how much he loves you and how much safer you are if you listen to him. Number two, that you trust his direction. Because what is faith at the end of the day? It's trust. You know, it's interesting. Jesus said, but everyone who hears these words of mine. Now, you know the passage. He said, if you hear these words of mine. By the way, when people read that text, they say everyone who hears these words of mine, they think he's talking about the New Testament. But you understand, the New Testament wasn't written yet. He wasn't talking about the Bible. (laughs) But everyone who hears these words of mine and builds my life on them, man, he's like somebody who built his house on a rock. But if you don't, hear his words and build your life on him, you're on sand. That's what he's saying. This is the key. This is the key to life. And then we'll close with this. Obey him quickly. Obey him quickly. Learn to say, God, I'm gonna surrender to you. You know, stop. Can I just say this in closing, your obedience? Stop worrying. Well, is that the Lord? Listen, if it's good (laughs) and it lines up with what you know the Bible to say, Do it in faith. God always honors faith. Do you know what if you're wrong? You know, one time I was fasting and praying and the Lord told me to fast and pray. I was in the prayer room and I had been fasting for like two weeks and the Lord told me to do that, I felt. But then my buddy Gordon, he comes up to me and he goes, hey Shane, I feel like the Lord just told me a word. And I go, what is it? He goes, I feel like the Lord just told me to give you my muffin and he put this giant alala berry muffin (laughs) right in my face. I had been fasting for like two weeks. Well, what you don't know about my buddy Gordon is, Gordon was a bodybuilder buff and for him to give away food was like, oh man. That was a sacrifice. So he goes like this. He goes, here, I want you to have my muffin. And I go, well, Gordon, either I'm not listening to the Lord or you're not listening to the Lord. (laughs) But here's what I know. If I do something good because I feel the Lord has impressed it upon me to do it and I find out that I'm wrong, what's the worst that's gonna happen? I'm gonna be humbled and the Lord wants me humble anyway. So it's a win-win. And it's a win-win for you. Father, I pray you'd bless these men and women. Help us to be the people you've called us to be that listen to your voice. 
that seek you. That we're not just seeking about you, we're seeking you. We're calling on you. We need something fresh. We need revival. And we ask that you would bring it to us. I'm not talking about emotional ecstasy or just people getting excited. Lord, I'm talking about transition of the heart, change. God, help us. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Amen.